Um, I'm Alan Penn, I'm the Dean of the Bartlett, which is the Faculty of the Built Environment at UCL. And so, very pleased to welcome you to this um, launching of a special edition of BRI. Um, the issue of health, the built environment, and its relationship to behaviour is, I think, a, a very a timely one. I happen to be chairing a, a an all part of commission at the moment, inquiry commission, on the relationship between uh, behaviour and the built environment. And one of the things that we're finding in that commission is that there's actually a, a lack of solid evidence um, around many of the issues that people have anecdotally said are really important. And so having a publication of this sort that actually marshals concrete evidence is, is tremendously important. Um, you know, we're all more and more uh, aware of um, the health and obesity crisis that's facing the nation. Um, it's, it's one of the things that is it, constantly around my dinner table, actually, and I'm uh, forced to, uh, to eat less and less <laughs> and to exercise more and more. Um, however, one of the um, parts of the whole, whole equation here is what is the effect of the built environment in this? Can we design buildings in such a way that people adopt healthier lifestyles? Um, and what are the factors in the way that we design and plan our built environment that actually have any concrete effect on any of these issues? And so this, this area of activity, physical activity, is something that has been gaining a lot of interest um, in research terms recently and is crossing over the boundaries between different disciplines, between the health professionals, between built environment professionals, uh, between sociology and so forth. And it's an area in which uh, the Bartlett at UCL has a certain amount of interest, but in fact there's a lot of interest in many other uh, parts of academia at the moment. So, great pleasure to, to sort of launch off uh, this event now. Which button works? Ooh, wrong direction. <laughs> Make you do it what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now let's try. Yes, that's the right direction. So there's the special issue. Um, I should introduce Richard Launch, who's the the editor of BRI, uh, Building Research uh, Introduction uh, and Information, and um, actually thank him very much for ensuring that this special edition has, has come together. What are we going to be doing uh, this evening, if I can make this thing work? That's what we press a lot. <laughs> um, a series of papers uh, are in it, which the titles are here, and I think we've got all the authors. Have we got all the authors? Not all, quite all the authors. A number of the authors here present. Um, you can see the range of um, different aspects of interest in this. Uh, these cross many different boundaries. So, for example, um, the effect of this as we're in an aging society. What are the effects on um, multiple different dimensions of health impact of the environment? Uh, age is one particular one. It's quite, I mean, worth going through uh, what, the, what the series is. Can we do the next, please? Uh, these are the links to where you can get everything from. Um, so please do uh, click on to that. We can come back to that at the end. And next, um, our speakers. So let me introduce um, Professor Alexi Marmot on my left here. Um, she's professor here at, at UCL um, and has been heavily um, concerned in this area of physical activity in the built environment for a number of years. Um, uh, Catherine Brookfield from the University of Edinburgh. Um, aging and health. That's the starting point. <laughs> uh, Marcella Ushi of the corner. Um, and Anne Marie Connolly from Public Health England. Um, Rachel Toms, the corner there. Um, and Bill Page from the BCO Legal in General. Um, so that's our panellists, and what are we going to do next? I think it's... Ah, <laughs> press the wrong button. <laughs> no, that's it.
That's it. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll kick off uh, with a few minutes from each in that order, yes? And then the other part of that is those who are overweight, who are even more numerous. So we're all made aware of this. The national press um, and international press report on it regularly. So we know it's a problem. What, why did we actually have a special issue that um, Marcello Ricci and I had the privilege of acting as, um, as a special um, editors, I guess? Um, why did we want to focus on the indoor built environment? We know quite a lot about the outdoor built environment and physical activity. What we don't know is very much about the indoor built environment. But the fact of the matter is that from the data we have about patterns of behaviour, we believe that people spend in a lifetime about 90% of their time in the indoor environment about 5% travelling and about 5% um, outdoors. We know increasingly more about the outdoor environment because of all the technology that actually um, allows us to monitor there, particularly GPS, so at least spatially we know a great deal. Um, but we don't have that same privilege indoors. These data incidentally come from the US. The figures might be slightly different in the UK but it's actually very hard to find data um, on these issues at, at a sort of um, reliable level. Um, so then I'm sure you've also all heard that the issue with obesity isn't just about eating, it's much more about um, a range of activities which include <coughs> eating, by all, you know, it's certainly a very important factor, um, but it also includes the amount of physical activity and increasingly evidence that sedentary behaviour in and of itself contributes to uh, the uh, epidemic. So we're starting to see this sort of approach, that sitting is the new smoking, that it's a now a public health hazard that we need to address. Is this exaggerated? Is it not? Um, remains to be seen. But you know, here we all are now sitting in an environment in an office building that expects us to sit, um, where you feel a bit strange when you stand up. I was like, okay, I'm standing because I'm speaking, but after I've spoken, I feel a bit strange standing up. So we also have this huge cultural overload that goes along with it. Um, and I did find this, um, this uh, cartoon um, last week uh, in the New Yorker, which I rather liked, the idea that those who sit whatever the posture might need to rethink again. Now, here at UCL, we've had the, uh, Marcello and I have been part of a joint um, piece of research over a couple of years, funded by the uh, School of Public Health Research, which sort of falls under, indirectly under the NHS. Um, it was called, it's called Active Buildings. The active part of our research has now finished. We're still finalizing some of our uh, of our uh, findings, we have a website that you might be interested in looking at, which is www.activebuildings.co.uk, and one of the pages there actually has the um, papers that have already come out of the study or related work that's been going on. Our partners here at UCL uh, come from the Health Behaviour Group in uh, the Department of Population, in fact, the Health Population. Uh, 
sciences, and um, you can see that there's been quite a lot of papers that have come out in this area. So we're learning more and more as we go along. I should also mention in the built environment field that one of the outcomes of our research has actually been to create a, a spatial metrics calculator. Um, and again, if you uh, want any more information on that, if you go online, uh, you can actually see how it works. It's open source, and there's a couple of videos that actually explain what it does and how to do it if you wish to. And that gets me on to some of the observations from the six papers that are in this special edition. They're really interesting papers. I really recommend them to you. Um, and what really is fascinating is that two of them are focused on the school environment, one of them on the workplace, and three on the elder care environments, one way or the other. Um, what strikes us in looking across, the, um, in, across all of the papers is that we don't have common languages in which to describe either the built environment or the relevant metrics there, uh, or indeed the, um, the different populations that are studied. They're not always described adequately. Um, the precision about how to describe differences in one environment compared to another is very much lacking, still to be developed. Um, we <coughs> have the concern that it's not just the objective qualities of the built environment ma that matter, but it's actually how you interpret them. And so the perception of what might that environment be for is perhaps as important, or at least has some importance compared with any objective measurements that one can use. We have some um, understanding from different papers that the whole business about physical activity in the built environment is for different purposes. Some of it is because people actively want to move. They have the intention of moving because they've read the literature, they've seen the ads, they know that activity is good. Other activity is there because it's essential, it's instrumental. You have to get from A to B. You need to, in, in a school, you need to go to and from class, to and from the playground, to and from the uh, the WCs and so on. Um, and many activities are actually mixed. These seem to matter in some of the research. Some of the studies are reporting interventions, and interventions, of course, the, the concern always is over what scale do you actually do some sort of trial of an intervention, um, and does it actually, does normal behavior revert if you wait long enough? or is it actually permanent change? This is terribly important if we think we're going to change behaviors, change environments in order to change behaviors. And the other uh, thing that impresses us looking across the papers is how very difficult it is for everyone in this field to actually get access to case studies, to get access to buildings, to get willing organizations to participate in studies, and then also to get participants within those organizations. So these are all the challenges that um, all the researchers whose papers are in the edition have overcome. As we look ahead, we think that these issues need to have more and more attention. We really need a richer development of theoretical understanding about the relationship between the both environment and behaviors. We need a clear taxonomy in everything that we examine, so that one paper and another are actually building upon one another rather than contradicting each other through the definitions of one piece that they measure. In some ways, we're at a very early stage of the sort of scientific understanding of this area in the built environment field. We don't even have agreed metrics about, for example, measuring floor area or distances in buildings or destinations in buildings or lots of other things like that. We need to get to that basic level so that the research can continue to flourish in order to help uh, deal with these very serious obesity problems. Um, we certainly would welcome more. Um, controlled intervention studies. Um, and um, what, looking ahead, we think that the whole move of um, Internet of Things, of wearable technologies, um, and of, of uh, mobile apps that actually can monitor increasingly more variables in the built environment and describe the built environment ever so much better. We think that this is a great sign for the future of research in this area. So the dependence of not having technologies equivalent to GPS for the indoor environment will be overcome. Um, and of course, none of this can happen unless there's a climate that actually says that we need more research 
that industry wants more research. And the research councils in the UK and their equivalents around the world uh, also uh, will, will uh, seek studies of this kind, interdisciplinary studies between those who are expert in the medical fields or related health areas, sports science activity, uh, sport activity science and so on, and those in the built environment. Um, in fact, we're struck that the, um, the papers that are in the journal actually come nearly all from the Anglo world. Uh, they come from Australia and New Zealand, and um, some of the researchers are from the US, from Canada, uh, and from the UK. Um, and while we sought as widely as we could papers from all over the world, it does seem that at the moment the uh, greatest area of, of concentration is in those countries, um, but we look to more studies in different environments around the world. So finally, I think to sum up, as we start to look across the built environment aspects and uh, the bigger question of obesity, um, it seems to me that it's actually at several levels that we need to be thinking. We certainly need to be thinking about active cities and active transport within them. Then there's the building level. And then within the buildings, there's all the sort of furniture and artifacts, cultural objects, some of the cultural objects that have a very long tradition, and for example, chairs with a very, very long tradition of acceptable ways of sitting. Um, but behind it all is the issue of changing minds and changing behaviours, if indeed we believe this relationship is strong enough to act. And I'm looking forward to hearing more from the speakers about their perception of the quality of the evidence. Thank you.
Homes accommodating several rooms or clearly demarcated spaces could support activity with individuals moving from space to space to carry out different tasks. However, again, a small minority uh, favoured, well, sorry, a small minority restricted activity to a single space, to a single room, or a single chair within a room, um, and organised their possessions and interests to be within reaching distance, with the result being a more sedentary lifestyle. Convenience, mobility impairments, and the high costs associated with heat heating an entire property helped explain this behaviour. So based on our findings, we developed a set of simple design recommendations intended to support older adults to lead more active lives at home. We then compared these recommendations against existing guidance and standards, specifically the Lifetime Home Standard and Scottish Building Standards. And in the case of the latter, we focused on the detailed guidance in the accompanying technical handbook. Interestingly, we found a lot of overlap between our recommendations and this existing guidance, um, particularly the uh, technical handbook guidance. We know that that's non-mandatory. So it would seem relatively straightforward then to meet our recommendations in new dwellings as you just build in accordance with the existing guidance and standards. However, it might be much more difficult to meet our recommendations in existing dwellings. For example, one of our recommendations was to create uh, straight stairs. In Scotland, at least, a lot of the tenements are the flats in tenements are accessed from winding stone staircases. So a couple of overarching conclusions from our work. Various aspects of the home appear relevant to older adults' active and sedentary behaviours. And directing and maintaining attention um, to a few simple um, items in residential development policy and practice could support older adults to lead more active lives at home. And our paper the, that I've just been talking about links to a, a larger three-year project called Mobility, Mood and Place, which is looking at how older adults can be more active in the built environment or how we can support older, older adults to be more active in the built environment. There's a whole host of academics involved in our study, and if you'd like to find out more about it, we'll have our website as well. Thank you very much. physical activity and sitting and uh, pedagogical approaches. 
and we ended up uh, having an exclusion criteria on outdoor spaces and play because we primarily wanted to look at aspects of the indoor environments that uh, are not only um, addressing physical activity and moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, obviously, I don't have time to go through all of the papers and the findings, just to mention that this was a uh, multidisciplinary team involving uh, uh, experts from the health environment, myself and Alexi, who then had colleagues from uh, public health and epidemiology at UCL, and also a colleague from, uh, with expertise in, in uh, pedagogy, uh, Richard Dantis, who was at um, the uh, IOE and is now at uh, East Anglia. So we set out a number of, uh, we, we set up a number of keywords, and I'm not going to kind of relay the whole of the findings, but uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, we found that there is very little research in this field, and that's pr particularly true for secondary schools. Um, there is some evidence that physical activity and uh, uh, had a positive impact on um, uh, behavior at school and uh, possibly a good impact also on academic performance. When it comes to the links between built environment and uh, 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 sedentary behavior and physical activity, uh, there were very few specific studies that were looking at the indoor environment. Uh, there is one example here of a study that uh, took a relatively small, co small cohort of 24 children uh, and then uh, studied them in their normal standard classroom environment. They then studied them in an uh, activity permissive environment, which is a plasticized pottery ring, which has all sorts of things standing desks, miniature court, indoor soccer, climbing frame, and so on. Um, and uh, their activity levels were monitored uh, with accelerometers. And then they were also monitored uh, during uh, their standard environment with six stand desks. And their uh, activity levels were compared with um, a matched cohort during summer time vacation. They found that uh, this particular type of environment obtained uh, activity levels that were comparable to the activity levels accumulated by children during summer school um, vacation, uh, but not as much as uh, the case for the standing desks, even though we slightly compare that to the pair there. Um, now, the point is that um, the authors of that paper, for example, conclude that perhaps dramatic and drastic changes should be implemented to the built environment to uh, accrue significant changes in physical activity. Um, and there is, of course, an issue of uh, scalability. Uh, the scalability is uh, an obvious one to do with, we, we can't necessarily uh, convert all our classrooms in coffee rooms with uh, indoor soccer and, and all sorts of things. Um, but um, more, more broadly about uh, how translatable some of these findings are when you take away the intervention side of things. Um, so one of the things that certainly intrigues me in uh, some of these interventions when it comes to, for example, introducing standing desks uh, in a classroom environment is often teachers are both participants but also almost uh, study co-creators because they have to, uh, on one hand they are asked what their perceptions are of the effectiveness, effectiveness of the intervention, but at the same time they have to be supportive of the intervention um, and whether they um, approve of it or not will ultimately dictate very strongly the success of it. And in this sense it's interesting because therefore the physical aspect, uh, the standing desk, is not um, an inert thing that you can just introduce in the, in the, in the building. And in that sense, um, in, it needs to be evaluated in that respect. Um, another thing that we came across and that Alexi alluded to was that um, when we did our keyword searches, we often came across the term built environment, but often then it was just one aspect of the built environment. It might be the playground, and often it might be the size of the playground or even the presence of the playground. What is really missing is a conceptualization of uh, the various built environment factors and how do they match onto behavior change or, or behavioral concepts. Uh, this is a taxonomy of uh, behavior change techniques. This is actually an app. Uh, developed by Professor Susan Michi here at UCL, uh, that uh, then kind of um, 
has created a taxonomy of the various behavioral change strategies. And what would be very interesting is to try and map out how, which aspects of the built environment may map onto some of these aspects and how. Um, a, a, perhaps a slightly closer uh, one is, uh, is um, a review done by a Cambridge group that looks specifically at choice architecture intervention and in microscale environments uh, with a classification that perhaps may speak to a little bit more to built environment professionals. Um, the point there is that um, um, I think the built environment in the school environment and more broadly uh, we need this within this field can be conceptualized as a barrier which can be it must be must be removed but there has to be an intention there for something positive to happen an enabler which again facilitates intentional behavior or a trigger which triggers subconscious or habitual responses but really what i think we need more information besides the uh, taxonomy is understand a little bit more uh, the assumptions and the realities of intentions and habits and within the school environment this needs to be both for the students and uh, the teachers as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, if I may, sorry, forgot the last slide, slide, which I added at the last minute, that's well. Uh, uh, if I may just uh, say that we are uh, considering launching a new MSc pro uh, program in health and well-being in buildings. This is a provisional, provisional title. Uh, if anyone would like to know more about it or give me any feedback about uh, this idea, please let me know. Thank you. So next, the next part of this um, is to move on to our panellists, um, and I'm going to ask uh, Anne-Marie Connolly from Public Health England to, to have a, a kick off and a commentary, if that's okay. Okay, okay, thank you. I don't have slides, so I actually need some lights first. Put the lights um, up a bit. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll just talk a little bit. Uh, Public Health England, amongst uh, one of my teams, is we have a team working on um, place the built environment called healthy people in places. And what struck me about this and the set of papers really it is that we have been focusing on the external environment and a lot less on the internal environment in regard to physical activity and that interconnectivity with other people. Um, why is physical activity important to us? Well, it's a hugely important aspect of prevention and supporting good health. Um, it may a major role to uh, play in reduction of risk of heart disease and stroke and diabetes, in, in certain cancers, uh, in depression, and reduction of falls or, or, and uh, support uh, supporting the vulnerability. So it has a, it's a sort of super drug really if, if you could apply it in, in, in many different places. And so I think this set of papers is sort of reset for me, a, 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 it's like a re reconceptualization of indoor place um, from being, I mean, whether it's a home, the area of comfort, uh, shelter, warmth, uh, or in the, um, or a functional place in schools or, or, or workplace. Uh, and uh, for me, it's something to reshape my thinking about a balance of, of physical activity and possibly even slight discomfort um, within the internal environment, uh, leading to a better physical activity. Um, there's, so I think leading from there is perhaps how do we shape a discourse around that then um, and what types of ways should we talk about the role of the reshaping that indoor environment. We work with a lot of other groups, organisations uh, and so on and when we think about health and physical activity across the life course, um, when we talk with schools and we do work with schools is thinking about um, do we talk about physical activity or do we talk about better education attainment and which speaks better to the sort of education establishment so we perhaps operate within both. Um, when we're talking about uh, working age adults, I suppose it's getting over our sort of normative approach as well. Just say we, we actually have a research program not having our PHE or at those standing desks and there's even little facetious comments in the newspaper about what PHE is doing on our standing desks. So I think there's also a kind of cultural change that would need to take place once you have the right evidence in place to support it. Um, and of course, every, practically every building you go into at the moment, your stairs are hidden around the corner and your lifts are, are front and central when you go into them, um, even when you try and signpost better to, to the stairs. Um, 
And for our older adults, I think we perhaps have been thinking more about protection and support uh, rather than enabling uh, and normalizing exercise for, the, for older people. And I, I note from this is also is designing environments that are better for people with dementia, which of course is a huge priority issue for us and for government at national level uh, with our aging society. So how can we think about the environment as physical activity but linked with social connectedness that's terribly important for older people uh, as well. Um, kind of going forward in terms of thinking around this, is, is that there's sort of there's an issue about communication and influence. Um, about the rethinking and from a health point of view is that uh, we work quite a lot with schools and education. Um, there's the whole health and social care um, sort of um, world as well we need to be thinking about how do we uh, help shape that, whether it's occupational therapists or whether it's a social worker or local authorities. Um, um, again, we work with housing associations and employers. So there are many different audiences to help me think about what this might mean for them. And if we're talking about physical activity, um, we, we, we often have quite long to go to help think around the health of local authorities as well. Alongside the, sort of the design and build of professional health planners. But there's kind of two big issues for us um, when we're talking about anything related to health and making changes. One is the economics at the moment. Everything we're doing, people might say, what's the return on investment? What does this mean for our budgets? How does it make a difference? What does it mean for government spending? So everything we have to think about is to have you had in the, um, the, the financial and the pound, pound signs of input. And the second is the, we've come across quite a lot in terms of designing new places or the retrofitting. And so how do we think about the influence of the retrofitting as well? Because the vast majority of people are living and working in, in places that are already been built and have been designed in a certain way. So in terms of future thinking forward, uh, for me what was so interesting about this is in terms of thinking about uh, the scoping, the methods, but also the sort of definition and objectives, because they, they, they seem to be, you know, they're really different. And say for schools, uh, from our point of view, it will be about physical activity and uh, social social interaction, good emotional well-being as well. Uh, but for the schools, uh, obviously the focus is going to be about uh, good educational attainment as well. When we talk to employers about health and workplace, we have to speak in language about productivity, uh, better for the workplace, better for our outcomes of work. And when we talk with health and social care, it's about independence and well-being. So we use different languages and different uh, uh, focus of, of our efforts when we're talking to other people. So for me, perhaps the, well, the biggest message is we've been focusing externally on the outside environment, but the big figure there, about 90% of our lives spent indoors, I have to say it probably helps me really think about how we talk about our uh, health and physical place. Thank you very much. to um, talk about putting evidence into practice and how we make buildings as healthy as possible for the people who, who inhabit them and use them. Um, and in the built environment, when we are creating or reshaping, refurbishing or, or managing uh, buildings, we're used to um, crafting buildings that respond to the context and which, make, which meet operational needs. If, and which may be a communicative idea, designer's idea, or the client's idea to the outside world. Um, if we want to also build health into uh, the designs that we prepare for new buildings, uh, what should we do? Well, human beings essentially have the same health needs, whether you are rich, poor, or young, or old, whatever your cultural background is, whether you're working, whether you're caring for someone, whether you're being cared for, 
but your body and your mind kind of need the same things generally. So that really should be our starting point. And there are many factors, health determinants, that influence how healthy a person is going to be and whether they are going to fall ill in terms of getting a preventable disease or whether or when they're going to die. Um, and many of those factors we don't really influence <coughs> in the built environment, such as smoking, uh, alcohol, access to health services, other professions deal with those topics. So we need to look at what we do influence in the built environment when we create places and when we design build buildings. Um, and looking at the evidence, we think that there are four principal ways. Just for fire. <laughs> ways in which, um, in which we can design healthy behaviours into the places that people use and inhabit. So physical activity, healthy food, contact with nature, positive social contact. For each of these, there is really strong evidence, we know it, um, linking these functions with positive health outcomes, whether physical or mental or both. And, um, in shaping places, if 90% of our time is spent in buildings, then we kind of need to take responsibility for the behaviours and the health outcomes that we generate in designing uh, indoor environments. And as designers, we can apply our creativity to this challenge. Um, and we're really well placed, drawing on evidence, generating fresh ideas to look at how we build these four functions into schools, offices, supermarkets, places where people work, places that people move through. And so what might a healthy building look like in practice? It could look like this, white collar factory with a green space and a running track on the roof. It might look like this, uh, which is quite a bright light and a sociable working environment indoors. And that contact with nature would include um, breathing fresh air and having views and access to daylight even when you're indoors. It might look like this, homes where people can grow their own food and where you're more likely to be interacting with your neighbours and having that positive social contact um, and where children can move around quite easily and where parents feel comfortable letting their children move around. And it might look like this. In Camden they have uh, launched a project to improve physical activity by um, installing this uh, very creative play equipment in playgrounds and enabling those children to access the playgrounds outside of school hours and pass they can get in and then measuring the results in terms of the children's health outcomes. So although those four functions we usually associate with what people do outdoors and what people might do in their free time, actually we need to design them into buildings and into workplaces and learning environments because those are the places that uh, effectively nourish our health and well-being or starve us of some of the things that we need in order to be healthy and live uh, long and happy lives. So to conclude, I would say that if we are uh, involved in a building project or a regeneration scheme, we should firstly explore all the avenues for incorporating those four functions into the places that people will use and inhabit. Secondly, that we need to measure the results to see uh, what impact we're having on what people lives. Thank you. Thank you. And the second is, is my day job as analyst for the uh, research team at Lehman General Property. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Lima General Property is a subsidiary of Lima General. As the name suggests, uh, we have uh, UK assets in excess of around 16 billion, mostly in the, in the commercial sector. So this is all very important to our strategies going forward. Um, firstly, in terms of the, the BCO role, um, this is about defining and establishing best practice in office design and in office use. Um, so I don't have to worry so much with this role with regards to the cost of these measures and also the impact on investment performance than I do with my leader and general role. Um, but with this BCO role in mind, the case for encouraging healthy and productive workplaces is, is compelling. Um, there's no disagreements with it in principle. Um, Occupy health and satisfaction is one of our four key planks to shape our research agenda going forward. Uh, we recognise it's not a new theme, but it is certainly getting traction increasingly. Um, indeed, we've just commissioned a research study which Arup will be conducting, which will be about um, wearables um, in the workplace and trying to prove some of the concepts you've heard uh, this evening. However, even within the BCO, there's a view that the, the agent of change with the, all this is it rests with the occupier, it rests with occupational fits out, and it rests with occupational behaviours. And I think this is something we can certainly challenge. I'll certainly challenge it with my, my legal and general hat. Um, you know, at legal and general, I am, of course, also an office occupier. Uh, we occupy about 200,000 square feet in the city. Uh, we do have some health initiatives like one, one called step dropping, I don't know if anyone's heard of that, that's something that encourages us to walk between floors rather than getting the lift, then you can you can burn a huge four calories each floor, which um, is quite depressing when you know, someone brings the donuts in on their birthday, that's a lot of, a lot of floors you have to walk up to, to, to offset that. Um, so there's things going, uh, going on, but perhaps most importantly for, for today is uh, my role as representative of an investor and developer and talking about how we can uh, enable things. Um, I'd like to make two overarching observations. It's much more about the health, well-being, and productivity theme rather than sedentary behaviour per se. Um, the first is, is the fact that I think the industry is on a similar path to where we have been before with regards to sustainability. And uh, that's not because I think there's similar considerations. I think I think we can challenge the lumping of uh, sustainability and productivity in, in the same bucket. I think that's unhelpful. Um, because if you think back 10, 20 years to the journey sustainability went on in this industry, it moved from a set of principles broadly agreed by an enlightened uh, minority. Um, and that was, uh, and it started to influence action before there was an unambiguous set of data proving property investment outperformance if you did sustainability measures. I think the data is there now, if you choose to look for it. Some people still choose to disagree, but it's there now. But we saw the action happening before the data was established. Now with sustainability, there was a major stick to encourage changes of behavior from um, legislation. And there was also, perhaps more importantly, conviction by many in the industry that um, sustainability represented a significant risk to increased depreciation of build stock, depreciation of value, an increased obsolescence risk. And by doing the right thing for the environment in terms of um, introducing sustainability measures, you're also protecting your investors' value. So it's almost a, a win-win. Now, returning to health and productivity, I, I, I see it on, uh, as being on a similar journey. It doesn't carry the same threat of value depreciation. Um, it certainly doesn't have the same legislative stick as well. But I see us in a stage where there's acceptance amongst many that this is the right thing to do. There's, there's still gaps there, there's still people that don't buy the story. Um, but we're short of making a wholesale jump into best practice. And some of the images um, you saw just now do show a good example of good initiatives by good developers like Dell and London. Uh, but we're a long way short of establishing best practice. Uh, but like sustainability, I think the biggest change will come from establishing the conviction case that this is the right thing to do. And in our view, the conviction case here rests on the implications to tenant retention from introducing health and productivity and well-being measures. And if you can retain occupiers, then your income returns, and income returns are the highest proportion of total investment returns, 70% of all total returns come from income. So if you can introduce health, well-being, productivity measures, the staff in your buildings will be happier and companies will be more likely to renew and expire 
extend their leases, perhaps take more space from those buildings. Um, we're not quite there yet in establishing the valuation case, but I think this is, this is where we are, we are almost there in establishing the conviction case. Second key theme is, is what we can do about it, and hopefully I can make some um, practical observations here. Uh, firstly, I, I mentioned at the start, I think it's unhelpful to chuck health and productivity into the same bucket as sustainability. Um, I think doing, it's, it's, ha it's kind of happened in our industry a bit, but doing that ignores the fact that many of the initiative, initiatives for productivity and health are entirely separate from sustainability. It's also, to an extent, slightly, slightly insulting um, in, in my view. It implies that the softer side of property investment um, belongs to people outside of the investment agents, the, the planners, the developers, and especially people who do in inverted commas, this kind of thing. So it's the researchers and the sustainability practitioners. Um, yeah, that's that's entirely wrong, and we need to break away from that. Um, it also ignores the fact that the agents of change here, there, there, there are three of them, like sustainability. It's the occupier, um, but it's also the investor, and it's also uh, the developer. Each of those three can control different things in terms of making this happen. And with my uh, developer, Hat on at League in general. Um, you know, if you assume you are building a speculative office building, so you're building it without a tenant lined up, um, you can enable change here. Um, you can ensure certain standards are established around ceiling heights to enable proper air circulation, which, which helps um, productivity. Uh, the right amount of natural light is built into the design. Um, bicycle spaces, um, scalable and granular building management systems can, can really work. But also green space, we've heard about both in, inside building and outside of building can, can help with productivity and health. Um, the important thing here is building to shell and court. So that means that the base build of building is completed and you only start adding in uh, the air conditioning and other mechanistic aspects when you start talking to, to occupiers. And that's a, that's a change in behaviour. You Normally, um, the development industry will build to category A, which can then sometimes be ripped out by an occupier because it's not what they want. The key, the key is, it's, it's a massive waste of resources, but it, but it happens, and I think we can blame less agents for that, frankly. So, okay. um, anyway, so, so the key change of uh, behaviour here is, is you know, build to shell core, then engage with the occupier, come to some sort of financial arrangement, which isn't so difficult about um, suggesting the right mechanisms. And even when you come down to category B fit out, which is the soft furnishings and things, you know, sure, yeah, little things like the right, even down to the right carpet tiles, you know, things that have limited uh, VOC risks, um, um, volatile uh, compound risks are introduced. Um, and this is quite easy. Um, when you think about it, step back and think about it, what it means is a change in dialogue um, not necessarily a change in action. In fact, you're actually de-risking some of the development stage. It means speaking the language of the, the HR director rather than the property person at, at the corporate you want to bring into your building. So, you know, we are doing X, Y, and Z because there is proof that it improves productivity of your staff. That doesn't really happen at the moment, except for a very few examples. In terms of the investor, um, this is slightly different because you. You presume you are you are buying an up and left building. Um, you know what can investor do to enable change here? Well, this again is about dialogue with the occupiers. A good investor should be talking to their occupiers on a regular basis anyway. But with productivity and health in mind, it's about making sure they are using the equipment within the building in the way it's designed to do, uh, recognizing where it's not being used and, and enabling change there. And again, it's it's having the dialogue with the, the HR director who. Is donated normally on the on the board anyway, rather than just the property guy or the or the managing director. It's about it's about speaking the right language, and and to coin a phrase, this is about establishing buildings, not just having an absence of bad things, which is which is kind of the sustainability accreditation route. But it's a building that encourages good things. And you might not have the legislation behind it, but it's certainly something something you can do. And when this is more ingrained in practice, which is the direction we are hopefully going, then the evidence will come about tenant retention, which valuers can then use to say, you know, building X will outperform building Y because it has these initiatives in place. We're not quite there yet, but I think the conviction case behind it is, is building, and more enlightened developers and investors will, will recognise that it's, it's kind of a race to the top in terms of establishing best practice. 
uh, that's all I had to uh, mention. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very positive um, note on which to kick off a discussion. Where I'd like to go with this is actually going back on the idea that there are enablers, barriers, and, and triggers. I thought that was a remarkably useful uh, set of, of pre um, sort of angles on which to start. What's the barrier to this? I mean, perhaps from a BCO point of view, what, what leads to us building buildings in which the uh, stairs are hidden behind firewalls? Um, good question. Um, you, to some extent, you can you can blame uh, the BCO because uh, we 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 have a guide to specification, which um, we would emphasise the word guide in that. It's not a set of rules, um, but um, the industry do sometimes regard it as as rules. And, and things like you know, fire escapes and stairs are there for that safety purpose, and there is a you know, a, a view that they should be hidden away alongside with the, you know, the core, the air conditioning units. And, and whatnot. There is pressure from occupiers, and you know, occupiers are everything in our industry. If you don't have occupiers, you know, buildings are worthless. Um, to bring things like staircases into the centre of the, of the office to improve circulation, I mean, you can, you can visually see down floors and you see what your colleagues are up to, and that, and that will help uh, physical circulation. The one of the blocker with, blockers with that in particular is it has. It, has to be led by the occupier to a great extent because you can't, you can't develop a new office building and have internal staircases because that implies that you will only let it to one tenant uh, because there's a divisibility risk to having a, a big spiral staircase or, or, a, or a centerpiece staircase. Um, a risk averse investor would say, okay, well, that, what happens if the market falls and I don't get a single tenant for my entire building, I might have to let it floor by floor or half floor by floor and that central staircase doesn't work. Um, there is also um, a very practical um, investor protection risk about if you, have, if you do have a nice central staircase, what happens to your net decibel area as well? That's, that's floor space you're not charging rent for necessarily. So there, yeah, there are some practical blockers. I think we can all, as an offer, I, I would love number one column street to have a central staircase so we don't we don't go up, up, up and back on this anonymous uh, set of stairs, um, but you know, there are some practical reasons it doesn't You wouldn't be prepared to pay a big premium for that. I can speak to our chief exec around that. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we've got, well, we've got 10 years left on the lease. Um, I think if we, if we said to our landlord, look, we'd, we'd uh, you know, happily extend our, our lease, pay a bit more rent for if we could have these measures, a conversation would happen. But it's not something that is built into a perspective of school. So, so other key barriers from anybody here. What, what do we perceive from our different perspectives as the barriers to um, the provision of buildings, which are really encouraging of active, healthy lifestyles? Alexa. Well, I think the way the build position it is saying that in a sense you need the, um, the believers, people who have faith without evidence, to start off the trend. Um, is, is a real challenge um, because um, you know that that really does mean that somebody has to go against convention, take the risks, take the financial cut um, uh, if, if necessary. Uh, and I don't really think that I can yet identify uh, any really great spokespeople for this particular area. Um, could I make a? Please, please do. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm, uh, Paul Nick, I'm the chief executive of uh, Step Jockey, actually. So oh, yeah. right. <laughs> and uh, you guys do invest a lot of getting people yeah. using your stuff. I've got my four cameras. Um, <laughs> you see it. Uh, but one of the um, oddities I find with uh, pushing this initiative out is a barrier is not having. Uh, a official guideline uh, for movement or activity within the built environment. So it's quite odd that quite often uh, when we sell this product to get people moving uh, on the stairs in buildings, 
Uh, the business case that is put up by the client is all about uh, saving people energy uh, or, or saving carbon. That they do have guidelines for, or it's all about saving uh, people time. Uh, that again, companies have very firm guidelines on on productivity, and it seems that we're missing a set of activity uh, targets or guidelines for within the built environment. And I could see that uh, would work well not just within buildings, within schools, but also um, uh, for active travel as well. Uh, and that, that may be something for PHE uh, to look at. I mean, perhaps not legislation at first, but targets. I've done my 10,000 steps today. Yeah. <laughs> 10,000 <laughs> steps is a prime example of a, uh, of a sort of target that people have adopted. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's one for four hours standing uh, a day, which was recently proposed um, by a, a group of academics. I'm a visitor from a previous millennium. Uh, I look around and I recognise a few other people who fall into the same category. Uh, um, uh, it seems to me that um, I grew up in a world where uh, I've never heard of 10,000 steps, but hardly anybody was plump, uh, let alone uh, very obese. Um, and I wonder what it was about the world. 1950s and the 1960s that did that to us. We didn't talk about the business case for uh, designing, uh, for example, for improving uh, things like uh, cycle sheds in schools. That just automatically happened. And there was something about the spaces between buildings that made it possible, acceptable to travel on foot and by bicycle between home and the school and so on. I wonder if this leads to uh, an approach to research, which is to begin with the question, how much of the world of the 1960 can we take away and still be free from the significantly higher activity levels, or whatever it is about the world of the 1960, that people are not getting overweight, and people don't get overweight. How much can you take away before you start undoing the benefits of going back in time previous uh, decades of the millennium. So, just to summarize, I wonder if there are connections between behaviors between buildings and behaviors within buildings. Uh, and I wonder if we are uh, home, home in uh, too rapidly uh, for the buildings discussion, looking at the building embedded in the wider culture. Could I just respond to some of the challenges or questions? It was very interesting when we started this special issue that we didn't know and, and were fully aware of the different scale questions. And there is a lot of research and a lot of emerging new practices about the neighborhood scale of the city, getting people out of their cars, getting to walk, getting them bicycle. Um, but we really didn't know how much research was available at the building scale, and whether this was significant or insignificant. Um, and what this special issue did, or the conversation which led to the special issue, is it showed us what research is available um, and, and where significant gaps exist in our, in our knowledge. Um, certainly, I think one that the research suggests you need both. You need uh, to think about and be active outside of buildings, but we do spend 90% of our time in a building, um, and within those 8 to 12 hours or more, if you're in a workplace or in your home, there are things that you can do as well. Um, yes. Not only stairs, but you know how you sit, how you move, when you move. Um, but your, your question is very provocative, because increasingly the demands on us some of the demands on some of us. Um, as a society, we're more desk bound. We do more what used to be called paperwork um, than as a population we did 50 years ago. Um, there was more physical work to be done somehow. Um, it's, it's been the nature of 
of work for many people has changed. Um, so accepting the, the office environment and the, the school environment, there are questions of what we can do inside. But they're, they're not isolated. They're part of, as you say, of the larger picture. One of the surprises that I had is where the gaps um, in knowledge were. I had assumed that uh, large research organizations such as the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, which had, or in the United States, which had a huge amount of uh, research on obesity and public outside spaces, had nothing on buildings and inside spaces. Um, you know, we were very pleased that there are islands of research which were briefly described and in the special issue and in other places too. But there are huge deficits here, um, which you know, we may want to discuss. And I guess some of the questions are, you know, where do we go from here, both in terms of a research agenda and what this means for, for practice? I've got a, a series of questions. Can I take three of them, ask the panel to respond? I think it's probably the way to start here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ali Almanami. I come from a background of a design and uh, industry. Uh, I'm not an architect, but uh, progressed and became a design plan. One of the issues which I always suffer when I am part of a team to design a project is the person who sits in front of me with the wallet in his hand and he's going to spend. He wants his building to be the utmost efficient operative machine, not the building. Therefore, the location of the services have to be here. Therefore, the maximum square footage have to be there. Therefore, the height, the headroom, and there is a long list of must, 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 must. Um, what we couldn't uh, do at the time, and we still have the same uh, difficulty, is we couldn't put the case to uh, the uh, people we're designing buildings for to say this is a necessity or this is a necessary item to implement and incorporate in our design. We have never had that pleasure. Uh, we always get cornered uh, by the, either the developer or the investor to say, this is exactly what you are to provide me. Reason is, these guys have a philosophy. And the philosophy is that a building is designed to help you, me, and the others to perform a task with a productivity factor. That's something I have uh, touched on many times. And he would say, if the services are two meters away, it means it will take more time in order to get to the bathroom or to get to the, to the kitchen. And where is the service going to be, the supplies, the storage? And at the end of the day, we end up designing an environment as complicated as a jet engine. <laughs> That's it. So just to bring some space and think, but the time we spend is, is so we are restricted. So it's a conflict between notions of efficiency yeah. and thinking about movement in buildings as being wasted. Correct. Yeah. So. I I'll come back to that one. Yes? I'd, I'd like to come back to Alice's things earlier on about um, the housing. I'm, I'm, my name's Ed Webb, I'm from the University, and I've actually just spent two days on building in, in, a, in a conference on building energy, with um, where they're looking at energy use in the building, energy monitoring in the building, um, and quite a lot of it was about the domestic going back to the home. Um, I experienced exactly the same kind of things that you're experiencing in how do we get into those houses? How do we get the knowledge of that information? Because if we want to work in homes, we need to get in those homes and know what's going on. So we've got some monitoring stuff going on. So some of the stuff that we've done, we've got PIR systems, project I've just been part of called Leader. We have 60, on average, 60 monitoring things going on in those houses. And I can probably work out how the people are moving around. I'm doing an online survey at the moment on thermal comfort for people in their homes. And I'm asking them, how long have you been sat where you've been sat and for those lengths of time. Um, there's a, so there's a number of issues that you're facing in the built environment, in the domestic environment, that we're facing also in energy monitoring, saving energy in the home, 
Um, and I think it would be very interesting for the two groups to sort of come together somewhere here because we're facing the same issues. And some of the technologies that we've got will be useful, I think, to looking at monitoring of those issues going on in the home and those kind of elements. It then, the conversations often very quickly go into commercial buildings as well because it's an easier space in some ways in which to work than actually in individual people's homes. But I think it's an interesting crossover here that uh, we, could, we could work on. Because again, if people are moving around their houses more, they don't need their temperatures so warm. So we've got health and we've got energy and Thank you both, so that's very helpful. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, so Michael Brooks, I work on a website called Design and Buildings with you. Um, a simple question really, I was just wondering whether the panel uh, coming up with their, their paper is taking into consideration any international comparisons. Um, I have a vague uh, recollection of reading something about Scandinavia or Sweden, being particularly good in this regard in terms of movable deaths, or just wondering if so, what's the kind of cultural um, relation? Or that they have in play that we perhaps don't have in place yet. Okay, so I'll let you go. Quick response on the last question first, so it's always easier to remember. <laughs> I think it's fascinating with the sit stand desk story that they were developed because of musculoskeletal problems. And they're possibly going to come into their own with the increasing evidence about uh, physical activity. Um, the northern European countries, for whatever reason, strong legislation that have actually always taken regard to the worker, the tripartite agreements between government, employers, and employees, basically, which have existed in countries like Sweden since the 1920s, um, and really haven't been damaged in the same way by uh, neoliberal economics over the last uh, few decades. They're a very interesting case in point. Nobody would, would allow a worker in an office building in, in a country like Sweden to not have a sit-stand desk if they wanted it acknowledging that this object costs a thousand pounds instead of two hundred pounds. A cultural um, expectation and a norm. So that the possibility then, um, if it's important for uh, physical activity, ought to be easier in the Northern European countries than here. Um, in this country, well, then that's seen as absolutely outrageous as, as a level of expenditure on employees. So I think it comes back to the first question about the um, about cost cutting and squeezing the efficiency concept uh, thou shalt have as little space as possible in the building as clean as possible with as low floor ceiling heights as possible and a whole bunch of other things with um, with with um, only a fire escape tucked around the back and never a beautiful staircase as well because why would you do something like that so these are the very big cultural and economic questions that we really need to change um, by having good evidence that it matters more if it does. Thanks. Anybody on um, that side wants to respond? Yeah. Uh, I think probably with the direct question to the PhD side to respond to that at least. Um, I, I think the question, you know, it's a very, very valid question about, you know, having guidance about physical activity or the built environment both internally and externally. Um, and certainly something we could think of developing more. We, we have already a good framework called Everybody Active Every Day. And we're refreshing that at the moment. I'm not sure we've got the interactive environment so we're doing that. I, I think we do, PhD, we're, we're an agency of Department of Health, um, so we don't make formal national rules ourselves. We can influence and help uh, inform. What we can also do is make some suggestions to others, um, and we could work with others to create guidance, documents, and so on, but we wouldn't, uh, and that's a, a very valid thing to us to be thinking of. So, so I've got a question here, which is, to what degree should this be a product of regulation, and to what degree should it be a product of uh, changing the mindset of the market? Um, have you got a view on that? I'm a civil servant. It's all right, we won't tell, we won't repeat. <laughs> I, 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 as you know, there are you know, quite a lot of tensions between those notions of things of what, what we regulate, and we're in an environment of slightly deregulation as opposed to increasing regulation. So that, that is the environment. And so the question is, what would trigger the market to want to do this in a different way? And, um, and I think there are, obviously I would say there are roles for both. And the question is, what is the balance between the two, and is the market section delivering? Which is the question, the, the key question about 
bodies and what's the market want. So I think that that may not be on the top of the agenda of the market at the moment. So the question about what is it will trigger uh, the market to think about this differently. Um, I think clearly I think there's a role for regulation as well, whether it's more you know, adding to housing standards, but actually those are shifting at the moment. So um, it depends on, on the time to be given and uh, what also what the public perceives as important as well. So there's the market, there's the public and what we actually how we inform and change and shape people's understandings and expectations and desires and what, what they would actually expect of buildings of us of, of, of other people. Okay, thanks. I, I want to before we finish off, just turn to the questions that are up on the screen. Because it seems to be we're, we're in a research organisation here and there's a particular responsibility to think about what the role of research is in this area. Now for me, I can see there's being a role of research as helping to de-risk um, industry's understanding of certain things that might tip their mind into doing doing things out, outside the normal behaviour of industry in the past. So, you know, why are the stairs always hidden? Um, we've had a very good response um, from Bill on this at the beginning of the evening. I'm just wondering what research would be required in order to de-risk that from the property investor's point of view. Um, I can imagine there being similar things to be said about policy. Uh, what research is required in order to be able to convince a, a conservative administration, if you like, that um, there are areas which perhaps do require regulation where, where industry will not uh, do the right thing off its own bat, but could be encouraged to do so if it was appropriately regulated. Um, are there any indicators for, for what direction the researchers should be taking? Yeah. I've been um, kind of asking the industry about feedback on the healthy buildings <clears throat> MSC and one of the feedback that I've had uh, quite a bit is uh, well you should include something about the business case uh, and how for example uh, healthy buildings uh, make people for example more productive or more academically uh, better etc. Um, and so in a sense I think uh, that's the million dollar question that could in theory, facilitate things in my mind. Um, but I also have to say I'm deeply troubled by going solely in this direction because um, I think if we only look at do we do things because there is a business case, because it makes financial sense, we will end up down the same sustainability kind of uh, that going down the road of the same sustainability thing where okay, if it doesn't make financial sense, we will not do it. Um, and I think. Ethically, as researchers, we always need to push forward the agenda of what makes sense for uh, people as individuals. We're talking about health and well-being, and so you know, it may not make them more productive as machines in the workplace, but if it makes them better as human beings, make them feel better, I think we should still push for that. And I know it sounds completely naive saying that, but I also think that there's a risk that if we pursue too much the productivity angle, the business case angle, this, this issue might actually fold on itself uh, in 10 years time. Thank you, okay. I think that okay. there's another dimension there, which is the, co the future costs to the NHS of treating preventable disease. And those costs are rising unsustainably um, in, um, in broad terms and in, in um, terms of the proportion of GDP. So, um, that the cost of the NHS potentially bridge that gap between finance and people's lives and, and ethics. So perhaps that is a way. So of course the NHS costs are borne by the NHS and the workplace costs are borne by you know whoever. So that that's one of the, the things about how do you share that, uh, which is something that perhaps as a society we should have a view on. But that's a big thing. Yeah whether those two persons are effectively the barrier the fact that there are different uh, people holding those strings and whether we can actually manage to get over that. And we all pay for it because we're all taxpayers. Yeah. Um, just uh, as you were sort of building off, you were saying earlier about not wanting to pass too narrow and feel down too much and leaving the 
themes around that. I think, um, so perhaps in terms of the research agenda, um, interdisciplinary working and taking a sort of more holistic view. Um, our research is funded by a cross-council programme, so it's led by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, but it has money from different research councils involved, so that kind of frees up the field in terms of what we're looking at and how we're going about looking at issues. And I think it's that more sort of holistic view, as I said, looking at a variety of different disciplines um, involving a variety of different academics and other partners is perhaps how we can um, sort of push the agenda on rather than just focus very narrowly on one particular discipline or one particular issue. This, of course, is an area that's under threat as the research councils get squeezed for funding mm -hmm. because they all tend to go back to their core remit rather than on the cross disciplinary work. Yeah. Okay. Are there any final questions here? Yes. Um, Sorry, not that, did, did you've had one already. The gentleman at the front. Yeah. <coughs> I've got two questions, actually. Um, okay. uh, firstly, does anyone have a view on whether? Planners perhaps should take a role in this and they um, whether or not <coughs> a building promotes health will be one of the determinants of whether a building gets planning permission because that's quite a major milestone for both the client and the architect. After you've got planning, you can kind of fudge your way through the other regulations of my experience. Yeah, I mean like it's happiness. And um, my other thought is about education in schools and uh, if anyone has any ideas on alternatives to education that perhaps are more developed in other countries, for instance, I've seen articles about how the Netherlands uh, tend to develop more holistically the children and allow the children to be a bit more uh, progressive, um, active in their choosing different ways in which they learn. And that affects how the building is designed. Um, there's a sort of reciprocal relationship, I think, between uh, the culture and the design of each building. But those are both very good um, questions. Uh, sorry, there was one more from the back. I was just going to say this has been quite a fascinating mix. Um, I've spent over 40 years at the sharp end of facility management and I'm a graduate of UCL. Uh, one of the things that we seem to have completely lost sight of is that there was a time, and Henry Newman was one of those, the work standing up at a desk. Look at the scriveners as in Dickens. They all wrote standing up, they moved around. And if we talk about the environment as it is now in terms of its pollution, you only have to look at the pictures of L.S. Lowry and the matchstick people. You don't see obese people. You see thin people. And the environment was heavily polluted, worse in Manchester and Salford, which he depicted so vividly. It's worse than it is today. The people were doing manual labour. Correct. And for a period, they were on rations. Yeah, and there was no service industry as there is today. And mm. curiously or interestingly, if you look at third world, you don't see obese people. Ah, oh, 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 changing. <laughs> changing. Okay. Um, now, very cunningly, the I see has arranged for. Uh, the drinks and little sweet upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I presume this is uh, a purposeful um, invention. <laughs> um, do you want to say anything at the end of this? Just before we move upstairs, I hope you will come to join us there um, and uh, go several times up and down the stairs because I'm afraid this is my first floor. We should have moved my gate to what, what I would like, just like to say is a huge vote of thanks to Richard Lorch as the editor of this uh, special issue at BRI. It's been an absolute pleasure working with Richard over the last uh, I think about a year and a half since we first developed the idea and then went through the whole process. We've been guided remarkably through this and I think that um, all of the authors will have also received some um, through Richard's guidance on all of the various reviews that people went through, um, a really excellent uh, process throughout. And I'd just like to offer our thanks, and I think to everyone in the room who's interested in the area, I think you've done a real service to, uh, to this area of inquiry, and I uh, look forward to more such papers coming up. Thank you.